family planning. is a precondition for women's Thank you. Good morning. No, that, that is not going to work for me today. Good morning. Should we try side by side and see who wins? OK, I'll start with this side. Good morning. Good morning. Woo, yes. And this side, good morning. Good morning. Awesome. You both won, in my opinion. So we'll go with our first Kinyaranda lesson. I don't want you guys to leave Rwanda without knowing anything. So we'll go with Mngara Mutse. And that's Kinyaranda for good morning. If you ever leave Rwanda with just one word, keep that one. So Mngara Mutse. I'll just have non-Rwandans reply to this one. Mngara Mutse. Ooh, you're doing a good job. You're all going to get national IDs at the end of the session. <laughs> so um, welcome, welcome to this session. Before we get started, I would love us to start with an energizer. A lovely lady from Ghana is going to lead this one. This is Youth Connect Africa. So why not have someone from Ghana leading this one? A round of applause as she comes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam MC. I'm from Ghana. My name is Solestina Bekamensa from National Youth Authority. Uh, ever since we came, it's been a very innovative and educative session. We are proud to be African. Are we not? Yes, we are. We are proud to be Africans. So if you see me or if you see all Ghanaians here, we are with this song. Africa, Africa, oh say, yeah. You respond, yeah, yeah. Africa, Africa, oh say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Africa, oh, yeah. Africa, oh, yeah, ah, yeah. Me say, Africa, Africa, oh say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Me say Africa, Africa, oh say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Africa, oh, yeah. Africa, yeah. I, uh, is it not wonderful? It's wonderful to be an African. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, my voice is not that good, but I promise we shall repeat this at the end of the session. Um, so ladies and gents, because this is a youthful session, I expect smiles throughout the session. Do we agree with that? 
okay? And I also expect you guys to tweet. And if you're not on Twitter, sign up right now. The hashtags are going to be projected on the slide here. Liana will help me with that, but it's YCA Health. Dear guest of honor, dear regional director for UNFPA East and Southern Africa, dear government representatives, dear UN resident coordinator here present, UN agencies representatives, dear young people, distinguished guests, all protocol observed, good morning. That wasn't loud enough. This is not what we agreed to be doing. Good morning. Good morning. That's what I want. So welcome to this session. I'm just going to ask you to high five your neighbor, the one next to you, and tell them welcome to the session. Yeah, a loud high five. I don't see it working here. What, what, what went wrong? High five, high five. Welcome to the session. So this amazing session was made possible by UNFPA Rwanda. I suggest that we give them a round of applause. And the title of the session is Youth Wellbeing Equals Economic Growth. We are going to be unpacking the links between a healthy youthful society and economic prosperity. Without further ado, allow me to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Solange Hakiba, the Deputy DG of Rwanda Social Security Board, for her opening remarks. Doctor, you're welcome. Good morning, everyone. I won't take that neither. Good morning, everyone. Youth is from 7 to 77, right? So I'm very happy to be among the, the youth. <laughs> Dear Dr. Julita Onabanjo, UNFP Regional Director, East and Southern Africa. Mr. Yusuf Murangwa, Director General of the National Institute of Statistics. Representatives of government uh, institutions, development partners, colleagues for the United Nations, representatives of civil, so, uh, civil society organization here present, young people from participating African countries, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, good morning again. I am delighted to be here with you among the youth to preside over the opening of the Youth Connect Africa Summit session on youth well-being equal economic growth, unpacking the links between a healthy, youthful society and economic prosperity. Allow me also, and it is my honor, to welcome you again in Rwanda and to thank you for your interest in the third edition of Youth Connect Africa Summit and to this session in particular. I would like to commend the Ministry of Youth UNFPA and other partners for the choice of this session focusing on youth well-being and how it can propel Africa's economic growth. It's truly amazing to see so many young people from different countries who travel to Rwanda, the country of a thousand hills, to connect with other youth from the continent and learn from one another. Thank you for being here. The theme of this session is aligned with the government of Rwanda seven year development program, the 2030 agenda for, sustain for sustainable development and the African Union agenda 2063. In particular, the AU dedicated the year of 2017 to harnessing the demographic dividend through investment in youth and health forms one of the core elements of the Africa Union roadmap. Indeed, Africa's youth is, Africa is a youthful continent with around 60% of the population being young people aged between 15 and 24. And this represents a critical mass of youth who will transform the growth and destiny of Africa if we invest in them and if we invest with them. The continent also has the highest child dependency rate in the world 
where for every 100 working age persons in Africa, there are approximately 73 children under the age of 15 who are dependents. The population is also estimated to double from a billion in 2010 to 2.4 billion in 2050. In 32 African countries, more than 40% of the population is aged below 15 years. Similarly, some 11 million youth are expected to enter Africa's labor market every year for the next decade, as per the World Bank analysis. By 2070, it is projected that Africa will have over 1 billion working age youth and over 80, 800 million children. The biggest puzzle facing African leaders today is how to turn its population into agents, agents of sustainable development. Investment in young people to harness dividends remains crucial. Demographic dividend, as defined by the UNFPA, means the economic growth potential that can result from shifts in a population age structure, mainly when the share of the working age population, 15 to 64, is larger than the non-working uh, age share of the population, those below 14 and above 64. This shift in population age structure can yield economic benefits if only the change is accompanied by sustainable investment in education, skills development, health, job creation, and good governance. This change can boost economic growth through increased productivity of the comparatively, comparatively large proportion of working age population. They could eradicate extreme poverty and prevent catastrophic climate change. Invests, investments made now in young people and changes made the way they are engaged will dramatically shape the future of our communities on the continent. Of course, the well-being and the development of young people should be at the heart of every government's development agenda. We must empower the youth so that they can truly fulfill their potential as key actors in achieving a sustainable and equitable world. Here in Rwanda, the healthcare policy has been evolving to ensure universal health coverage, reducing financial barrier in barriers in access to healthcare through the implementation of a community-based health insurance uh, or mutual de santé. In addition to formal sector health insurances, it enables the most vulnerable segment of our population to be truly, to be truly and fully covered for healthcare, thus guaranteeing ownership and active partic participation of the whole community into the country's journey towards development, self-reliance and dignity. Rwanda has registered positive strides in improving health indicators. As a result of this health insurance model, concurrently, concurrently working with key community intervention through our community health workers network and joint strategies with all the ministries showing that positioning health as a priority can even be placed into the road maintenance business, into the local government strategies and as far as a human security priority. This is evidenced by the fact that Rwanda has experienced the sharpest decline in maternal and child mortality across Africa. In the education sector, Rwanda also has one of the highest primary school enrollment rates in Africa, including for girls, and gender parity at the primary school level has been achieved. All this would be impossible without the government of Rwanda's visionary leadership and commitment. Recently, His Excellency uh, the President Kagame, while addressing the uh, over 3,000 youth during the Meet the President session, stated, and I quote, youth, you are the strength of today and tomorrow. As you build yourselves through education, and gaining skills. You have to begin by being a healthy person. We need you healthy. We must be sure the investments we have made are going to last. 
end of the quote. So when we talk about universal health coverage, what are we really talking about? Three main concepts. How many people are being covered by health insurance to, uh, re to remove financial uh, hardship? This is where we want you to take the lead. As young as we can all be, disease strikes at any time. And when, in the concept of insurance, the, s the, the healthy will support the treatment of the sick, and the wealthy will support the treatment of the most vulnerable. Second concept, what are the services that are being covered by the insurance among the services that are being offered in a, a health facility? To this point also, we want you to take the lead. The third concept is to what extent is the service covered actually covered to again remove the ex uh, catastrophic expenditure for households. On this point also, we want you to take the lead. With such a vibrant youthful uh, youth population, we expect proactivity in covering the vulnerable and protecting the less fortunate. I therefore call upon our speakers and all of you participants to deepen this discussion and deliberate on how our African youth will sit around the table and not be on the menu to expand access to quality health services, address existing health inequities, and ensure that they are empowered enough to contribute to economic growth of the continent and achieve sustainable development goals by 2030. More importantly, I expect the session to come up with actionable recommendation for member states to put into action. On this note, I declare this session officially opened. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. How about another round of applause? Thank you, guest of honor, for reminding us that you expect us to take the lead. Young people, are we ready? Are we ready? Now that, yes, I'm not sure. Are they going to leave here confident that we are ready to take the lead? It should be loud enough. Are we ready? Okay, nice. Um, so I think questions like why health at a Youth Connect Africa Summit? Why sexual and reproductive health at this summit? Why universal health coverage at this summit? Um, I have good news for you. All those questions, some of them were answered in the remarks of the guest of honor, and more is to come in the panel discussion that is next. On that note, allow me to introduce our amazing moderator of the day, Ms. Barna Namata a journalist working with the East African newspaper, a weekly publication of Nation Media Group based in Kenya. A warm round of applause for Namata. Thank you so much, uh, MT. Um, it's a great privilege and honor to stand in front of you, especially young people. Um, and I must say, well done, UNFPA, for involving women in this session. Uh, the organizing committee of this session, it's been women. I've been engaging with women. Uh, the UNFPA director, who I will uh, shortly invite here, is a woman. The MT is a woman. So I'm in the right place uh, for me. So thank you so much. And again, um, thank you so much for thinking about the youth, the youth from all over Africa, you're welcome. And now allow me to introduce uh, the panel who will try to dive into the question of health and economic being. And the reason for this is because quite often uh, we have someone from the statistics body. You will hear that you know Rwanda grew by you know, 10% double digit, what does that actually mean in terms of health? 
as someone who is young, why should you begin to pay attention to your health behavior? So I'm very privileged to introduce my panelists who will be helping us to understand the linkage between health, why you should be healthy, and how you can actually contribute in the long term and benefit from the growth that we're seeing around, around us. And when we talk about growth, what do we actually mean? You know, the buildings that we're seeing, if it's KCC, if it's Kigali Arena, are we thinking about 10 years from today, as the youth, what is going to be your role? And with that, allow me to invite my panel. I'll begin with uh, Dr. Jirita Onabanjo, the regional director for UNFPA East and Southern Africa. She cautioned me about protocols, so <laughs> I won't say much, but she's a, she's a public health uh, physician. Thank you for joining us. The next uh, panelist is Dr. Yusuf Murangwa, the Director General of our National Institute of Statistics, a household name. He's very passionate about uh, evidence-based uh, policy. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yus uh, Mulangwa, for joining us. The next is uh, Mr. Agassi Maxian, the acting country director for the World Bank and the senior economist uh, for Rwanda. Thank you so much for joining us. Last but not least, um, quite young and youthful, uh, Grace uh, Miss Grace Amy from Uganda, and Grace uh, leads uh, an incubation hub, Outbox, uh, based in uh, Kampala, Uganda, and she will tell us more about uh, her work. And how it will go, I will just ask the opening questions, uh, five minutes strictly as we had agreed, and then I'll open it up to you uh, for questions. Just to mention, we'll be expecting a special intervention from uh, Mr. Babu, Babu Kamara. Please uh, have your notes ready. After this, we'll have you uh, make your comments. Please check if your mic is, is working. Mic check? Is, is it working? No. Okay, okay. So I will start with you, um, the acting country manager for, for, for the World Bank, uh, Agassi. We've seen that uh, Southern Africa has been recording strong growth over the last decade, which has enabled it to reduce poverty by to at least 43% of, of, of the population. But then we're seeing that uh, as the population expands, uh, which is expected to be 2.5 uh, billion by 250, the region faces uh, a critical challenge in terms of uh, long inclusive uh, growth, but also many countries are struggling in terms of uh, reproductive health uh, problems. And by that we mean uh, we still have many young girls and uh, women that are of childbirth that die, that do not survive. We have impoverished uh, women that suffer, suffer disproportionate, bear the burden of sexual transmitted infections, gender-based violence, and related problems. Could you give us a sense, help us understand of how universal health coverage 
poverty, alleviation, and growth are linked. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll begin by, uh, uh, by a word of appreciation for this opportunity to be here. It's amazing. Uh, welcome everyone to this amazing country, Rwanda. And uh, I, I'm guessing that there are a lot of people from uh, uh, all, all of the countries in Africa and also beyond. So welcome to Rwanda. And we, uh, the World Bank in Rwanda, we are very happy to be here and, uh, uh, and we're very happy to be with Rwanda in this very interesting journey of human development and uh, economic growth. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that you uh, will learn a lot uh, from uh, here, being here, learning from each other, from Rwanda, but also from each other. But uh, I'll go to the question and um, I think uh, it's... Uh, 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 the fact that I'm sitting here as a World Bank person, uh, and you know the World Bank is about economic growth transformation, it already tells that uh, it's such the human development, health, is such an important issue for across uh, you know, the spectrum of uh, development policy that there is no way to achieve the targets of poverty reduction and economic growth without addressing human, human development and health uh, particularly, right? Um, as, uh, as the moderator mentioned, um, there has been huge progress in Africa region. You know, the poverty is uh, getting closer to 40%, going down, getting cl closer to 40%. Um, uh, we can say the f glass is full, uh, half full, and uh, 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 some people may say half uh, empty, but we believe that we are more optimistic and we believe that for Africa the glass is half full. When it comes to human development, it's, easy, it's very easy to say that, look, um, see, we have a growth, so households are becoming better off. Co uh, governments are uh, becoming a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, in uh, having more resources, so they can spend a little bit more on health and education. So let's continue this, and we could become wealthier. We spend more, and our, edu our kids get uh, more educated, and our you know, citizens become healthier. But actually, uh, uh, that's one way of looking at it. So what we realized at the bank, and I, of course, you know, the, the whole big family of UN and many countries that uh, are part of the, of the part of the system, is that actually um, um, uh, it's not that growth has to translate into, into human development, but we need to invest in human development to make sure that the growth happens in the future. So that's a very important distinction. It doesn't mean that the results of the growth shouldn't be used for <laughs> addressing human development. Actually, it means that we need to do much more. It's not just, okay, we are wealthy, so we're investing in health. No, we need to invest in health to be wealthy in the future. There is a very strong case for that. And universal health coverage is very critical in this, right? I mean, there is also one way of looking at the universal health coverage, which is purely human rights, which is very, very important. But on top of human rights, there is also this economic rationale. It's pretty much the same as in gender issues, right? It's a, it's a pure human rights, and it absolutely needs to be, uh, become a, a center stage question for many uh, policy debates, gender equality. But at the same point, we all know that it's an also there is a very strong economic rationale, economic reason, you know, why we need to have gender parity, why we need to have uni universal health coverage. That's why uh, uh, World Bank is very happy to work with many other organizations and governments to be present at the scene, so to be able to contribute to this. And uh, Rwanda, in this respect, is a very interesting uh, country. As you know, Rwanda's, uh, you may know that Rwanda's insurance coverage is one of the, one of the, one of the best in, uh, in Africa region. So that's very encouraging. And uh, I think uh, there is more that Rwanda needs to do in order to make sure that, uh, you know, the quality uh, becomes better. Of, uh, and, uh, but it goes without saying that Rwanda has achieved a lot. And the best indicator, of course, would be that most of health-related uh, SDGs, Sustainable Development uh, Goals, have been met in Rwanda, which is a very good sign. But at the same time, uh, I would like to conclude by saying, uh, by mentioning one uh, 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 initiative that World Bank started uh, two years ago. It's called Human Capital Index. And I think that uh, brings home the idea of investing in human capital to make sure that the countries become wealthier going forward in the future. This is what we try to capture by calculating Human Capital Index. And Human Capital Index actually is saying that 
uh, the child that is born now in a country A, uh, uh, to what extent the child will be able to feel f fulfill its potential if, if the child received uh, 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 good education and good uh, health services. And for many countries, uh, this uh, uh, index is somewhere close to 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 which means that even in a situation in many sub-Saharan Africa at the same GDP per capita, same wealth, the kids, because of not getting sufficient education and sufficient, uh, and sufficient health services, they perform only at one third of their potential in terms of income, in terms of the contribution they're making to, the, to, the, to the, their economy, actually. So it just shows the importance of investing in education and health. And in Rwanda, I would highlight the need of doubling the efforts on education because on many aspects of health, the country got it very well. But I, uh, in many other countries of sub-Saharan Africa, education, uh, health is also a big of an issue. But uh, 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 making sure that uh, universal health coverage is there and figuring out the economics of it because that's the very important part of the uh, you know, UN uh, uh, Human Rights uh, Declaration. That ha it has to be, it has to be, uh, 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 financially uh, meaningful. So you, you, we need to figure out together as a country, as a society, how to find this balance that we allow uh, even in poorest countries to have decent access to services. And that's, uh, that's a very tricky question, but that's a solvable question. So I'm very happy, again, concluding, I'm very happy to be here. I just uh, I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Before you drop the microphone, I just wanted to, to go back to, to Rwanda specifically. Uh, I mean, as the World Bank, you've done quite extensive research in terms of uh, Rwanda's, the Rwandan context in terms of healthcare. Could you give us concrete examples in terms of uh, coverage? What are some of the lessons that we could learn from the Rwandan model? I'll be asking uh, the other countries, but for Rwanda, what are some of those lessons that we can take from the Rwandan model? Yeah, I think there is a lot uh, that uh, one can learn from Rwanda model and uh, mostly positive things. Uh, I would say uh, the community-led initiatives uh, are in many, many different areas in Rwanda and especially in health. So we have this community-based uh, health insurance in Rwanda which uh, allows uh, access uh, of uh, even the poorest to the health system, right? And also in terms of, I mentioned the economics, the uh, affordability of that. Uh, Rwanda also have a system, has a system that uh, 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 finds those who are the most vulnerable and actually waives the fees, right? So probably I'm not the best person to discuss this because we have the representative of from RSSB, but uh, so the system allowed to have very, very high uh, coverage. There are still people who are not covered, but just like in any other countries, they believe that they don't need to be covered because they're young. And actually, we found out that uh, 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 health insurance misses a lot of healthy young male people, so we want them to be covered to contribute to the to the you know common cause, because you know right now if they contribute, the system will be better off because they'll probably not use much, but then uh, of course uh, the, it also will be for beneficial for them as well because at some point they'll get uh, to that point when they'll need the health self services. So as I said, I think Rwanda uh, has a lot to tell others how to get it right, and I would highlight these community-based initiatives, but also government support for the tar for most targeted. Having said that, we would like to see better targeting of uh, 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 this um, uh, system of subsidies for, for the premiums that the people are paying, uh, because as in many other countries, basically all countries, you have exclusion error when you don't, when you exclude people that need to be in the system because you're probably not able to you know, with high certainty, find out who is the most vulnerable. And you also have inclusion error. You include people who are not supposed to be there. So this is an issue that every country is dealing with, and in including Rwanda. But that the trajectory is, is, is very positive, and it's very clear that Rwanda got it right. Um, I want to bring it back to UNFPA. Um, could you share with us your, your experience at uh, UNFPA? You work across uh, Africa within the lens of the demographic, uh, demographic dividend. If you could uh, give us a sense of why and how uh, sexual and reproductive health of youth, of youth is fundamental 
for empowerment and also a bit of the link to economic growth. Thank you, Berna. Can you hear me? Wonderful. So really, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, I want to start by really appreciating the government of Rwanda and Dr. Solange. It was lovely to hear the progress that has been made on health in, in Rwanda. Indeed, Rwanda, for us, when it comes to global health, is one of the shining stars that we give, and you heard it in terms of my brother who was speaking about some of the best practices that we can look at, not only in the continent, but the world at, at large. So I'm gonna give a shout out to young people. Viva young people, viva! I can't hear you. <laughs> okay, so you're still awake. I think for an organization in the UN system, whose main mission is sexual and reproductive health. Um, it really is wonderful to see where we are positioning sexual and reproductive health in the broader conversations around health, youth development, but Africa's prosperity. And I think what is clear to us and what must be clear to all of you young people is that on this issue, you have the highest levels of political commitment. As far as in the SDGs, but also in Africa's Agenda 2063, I think the positioning of the connection of good health and prosperity, but also of the demographic dividend, Africa's youthful population, if we invest in their health, their education, their empowerment, their employment, if we invest in good governance, if we ensure that that population profile that Dr. Solange spoke about, where we have this dependency ratio, that our young people are able to carry a less dependent ratio of population, we will spur the economic growth of the continent. We will make sure that we are prosperous. And I think this declaration and commitment by the highest levels of our governments and the heads of states, and Dr. Solange spoke to the Africa Union theme on harnessing the demographic dividend by investing in youth, shows that you have a platform for which to do your advocacy as young people. I think there's no question your health leads to economic growth. What we wanna ensure is that political commitment backs that, and you have that. And I think that's what we need to work on. In addition to that, there's many things within the region that help you make the case and hold your governments and yourselves accountable. There's the Abuja Declaration on how much governments need to invest in health and including sexual and reproductive health and young people. And that is something you need to be tracking. And again, Rwanda stands out as a shining star. It's 15% that governments should be spending in their national budgets on health. Rwanda spends 16%. So can we give them a clap, please? And I think these are important things. Um, my colleague spoke about investment and making the business case for why one needs to invest. And I think the data is clear. And you can look at it from two sides. And I think this is why it's good. We talk about the cost of inaction. If you don't invest in this, this is what the country carries as a burden. And there are lots of information. If you don't invest in child marriage programs, for example, the benefit to cost ratio of that is high because a young girl will be pulled out of school. She will have a child, a baby early. That will affect the health system's ability to address it, but also the population size her fertility and therefore the, 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 the rate at which the population grows increases. So that's a simple example of what we call a benefit to cost ratio. And, w and the World Bank and a number of WHO and a number of us have done those economic arguments. Similarly, if you invest in education of a girl, and we say, and I can give you a, a very quick one, if a thousand young girls stay in education for one year longer, you are reducing maternal death by two. 
So you really have a cost benefit for life save in terms of just education. Similarly, we think about it for a number of things. So, so I, think, I think we have the, the data, we have the evidence, we have the political commitment. So why are we still seeing that the investment in sexual and reproductive health and the investment in adolescent sexual and reproductive health is still quite challenging? So what is it? What is it? And, and sometimes I think it's because Africans, we are very conservative. When it comes to adolescent sexual and reproductive health, we hide under the carpet. We think young people, we think we, we appeared by divine intervention, <laughs> when indeed all of us sitting here came because we are sexual beings, because sexuality is part and parcel of our lives. And particularly for young people, we need to begin to ensure that they embrace the fact that they are sexual beings. And they might not be in child marriage, but I can assure you, who here hasn't had a love affair or dreamt of some Prince Charles or Prince whoever that will come and sweep them away and has been heartbroken? Is there anybody here who hasn't been heartbroken? No? Yes? Yeah? So we might, child marriage is a huge issue and it's a violation. But it's, on the other extreme, there are issues in our sexuality that we think about. We may not have gone and had a teen pregnancy and dropped out of school, but I can assure you there are girls here who have dropped, left school for two days or three days because they've had menstrual pain. Is that not part of your sexual and reproductive health? We might not have had an STI, correct? But who hasn't thought about sexual desires? So these are very fundamental things to our well-being, yet we shy away from them. And I think until we can begin to embrace those notions of not only the, the, the things we see, teenage pregnancy, why they're teenage pregnancy. I say for whole, the whole 420 million young people we have, we all have a sexual and reproductive health story to tell. We do, and I can challenge you all to that. So my appeal is let's try and make it a little bit more comfortable. Let's not hide behind the fact that we are sexual beings and that we have sexual needs. And those need to be brought to the fore so they can be addressed through the health system. At the moment, at the policy level, we're still struggling with ensuring that young people's sexuality is recognized in policies and procedures that allow them to access the right information to make those right choices in life. Whether it's teenage pregnancy, you're kicked out of school, you can't go back to school. So lost, again, economic capacity for the continent. Whether it's the age of consent for marriage, we're still debating. In this continent, with 54 countries, 24 still don't have a law on gender-based violence, including child marriage. We're still struggling with that. So at the policy level, there's a lot of work to do for which young people we need your voice because UNFPA can shout and give you evidence. But leaders want to hear what is happening in your life and how do we need to ensure that we take that on board. At the program level, my God, the finances for adolescent sexual and reproductive health, for health alone is challenging, for SRH in general is challenging, for adolescent sexual and reproductive health, it's even more challenging. And so I think this is where those economic arguments are really important. This is where working with your parliaments to really ensure you're tracking what is actually being spent on adolescent sexual and reproductive health is important. The programs are small. They're not to scale. They're leaving a lot of young people behind. Their restrictions, health providers are still stigmatizing young people's access. We still can't get contraceptives to young people to make informed choices. So there's a whole barrage of health systems. And so as we think about universal health coverage, I think we really have to position adolescent sexual and reproductive health within that. And at this point in time, not all packages are including that. And so I really, again, call on young people to put, I say, put your base in your voice, make your voice strong, and actually make that call for universal health coverage benefit package 
to include you. We know that it is, it is expensive to get access to health and your economic ability is challenged. So really pull that out. And, and, and again, as um, Rwanda is encouraging, invest in your health, invest in the health of the system so that when you are really in need of it, it actually can invest back in you. I'll stop there for now. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to slightly take you back on uh, contraceptives and young people. I mean, this is a debate in, in almost uh, all African countries. And going back to the issue that you mentioned of culture and you know, Africans trying to pretend that they are not sexual human beings when in actual sense we all come from, you know, from the earth itself. Could you give us, what is the evidence? Because sometimes the debate gets lost between the moral policemen and, and women and then and, and the religious organizations, but what is the evidence in terms of expanding uh, contraceptives for young people? I mean, the evidence is there that young people want access, we call it the unmet need for contraception. That means that they would like to be able to have a sexual activity that does not lead to an unplanned or an unwanted pregnancy, or in fact an STI and HIV. And so that unmet need is there. It's a desire when they do surveys that we're gonna hear about data, um, they ask young people, would you like to use a contraceptive? And they say, yes, we would but we don't have access to it. And that is because the system, the health system, actually has a lot of barriers for which a young person can go and get a contraceptive. And so we have to really think creatively, and this is where it's really important to work with young people to understand how would they like health service delivered to them. Some of them want to be able to just go into a pharmacy and get a or to be able to find a condom in a bowl in a bathroom and get it. Or to be able to actually go to a health provider and have that conversation, which we're really encouraging. Because I think to get onto a contraceptive as a young person requires a whole lot of information that allows them to make the right choice about which method is really the best for them where they are at. And therefore, it's really important to have those conversations and, and really, to, to, and this is the conversation around adolescent sexuality is one that we really have to become a little bit more comfortable, even as parents. Because the reality is young people are going on to Google to find out information about their sexuality, where to get a contraceptive. But we, they're missing some of the wise wisdoms that we want from, we call our, our in South Africa, grandparents are called gogos. But those conversations are important. The conversation that I have with my son about choices and whether to start sexual activity and when he wants to start, is he informed about this, are very important. And I think we need to do more of that as well. But the evidence is there. It's there in unmet need for family planning. It's there in the fact that when we also ask sexual activity, we know that young people are starting sexual activity without using a contraceptive or even a protective method. And that's a risk. That's a risk. So, so there is evidence. There is evidence. And, and through systems, we must continue to develop them. Thank you very much. Um, let me get to uh, Yusuf. You deal with numbers. and. Uh, what we're seeing is that external funding and uh, limited uh, resources are quite a constraint in terms of uh, human resources for health and commodities. Um, let's talk about health financing. Could you give us a sense, what strategies can actually uh, governments explore in terms of boosting health funding for economic development? And if you could you know, sh uh, sh give us a sense of how the Rwandan government is, uh, is addressing this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to commend uh, UNFPA uh, for organizing uh, this forum uh, and the discussions around health financing, health for young people. These are very important issues. And uh, it's, it's very nice uh, that uh, the room is filled mainly by young people. So uh, we are very happy to be part of it. Um, it's true, it's true, uh, 
health financing is a challenge uh, globally, uh, but not only health. Uh, globally, mobilizing resources for development in general is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, global challenges are increasing. Uh, we see uh, a lot of conflict and resources divert from development issues to conflict issues. Uh, we are seeing focus on things that have existed before that we've not been focusing on, like climate change and global warming, oceans, and so on and so forth. So all these things are competing for resources. Uh, that makes it very difficult uh, to mobilize resources for, for health. Uh, the SDGs from MDGs, MDGs we had around eight goals, SDGs almost doubled to close to 17. Uh, it makes it very difficult to get resources for health. However, it's still very important that we invest in health because if we don't, we lose everything. And uh, countries have to be very innovative on how to go about it. Uh, there are four things that can be done. The first thing is, uh, without any question, countries should invest more. Countries should get the resources to put in health. It's the smart thing to do. Not doing it is not very smart. Uh, as our economies grow, uh, governments should get money to increasingly increase the money that goes into health. That's very important. Uh, you can't achieve much if you don't have money, so we have to get that money. Two, uh, the health sector does not work in isolation. Uh, the health sector needs connectivity in terms of uh, utilities, water, electricity, the internet, and so on and so forth. Uh, the health sector needs infrastructure, they need premises, they need connections, roads that take you there, and so on and so forth. Uh, the health sector needs human resources in terms of uh, uh, doctors and others, and so on and so forth. So it's very important uh, that governments uh, coordinate better, coordinate better the different sectors, uh, so that the health sector can, for example, benefit from the education sector, uh, the health sector can benefit from the infrastructure sector, for the, from the utilities sector, and make sure that we can mobilize more to make sure uh, that we can deliver the services that are needed in terms of health. The, th the third thing that is very important, and actually, I don't want to say very difficult, uh, because we've seen countries like the Scandinavian countries, they're able to do it. We've seen countries that are very wealthy that are failing to do it, like, like the US, for example. Uh, and we are seeing countries like Rwanda that are very poor, but are trying to do something about it. And this is health insurance. Uh, the economics behind health insurance, and, and for, that matter, for that matter, universal health insurance, the economics benefit everyone. They benefit those that are sick. They benefit those that uh, are not sick yet because it's just a matter of time. Everyone will be sick at some point. Uh, they benefit the wealthy ones. They benefit those that are not very lucky to be wealthy. So it's very important that countries mobilize the whole population to be insured. Uh, in Rwanda, we've made very good progress uh, regarding that, and it's paying off. Of course, uh, we still need to do a lot of things. Uh, the third, the fourth thing, and I think uh, this will be the final one, is being innovative around offering services. Uh, money is very important, but money is not everything. Uh, we don't think in, uh, in development or in planning and financing, you just throw money to, to every problem. It will not work. Uh, you have to be very smart. You have to be very innovative. Uh, one good thing about innovation, for example, that is already happening in Rwanda, is trying to bring the services as close as possible to the population and actually in the process engaging the population to contribute something, not necessarily money, to make it happen. For example, community health workers. Uh, we've seen it working, we've seen it reducing maternal mortality very much, we've seen it reducing infant mortality a lot, we've seen it improving nutritional issues, We've seen it dealing with malaria. 
We've seen it dealing with uh, diseases that are due to hygiene and so on and so forth. So it's very important that countries work around what is possible in their countries and communities to make sure these services and knowledge and awareness is brought as close as possible uh, to the population. And we see it happening in almost every intervention. For example, in uh, use of contraceptives, we see it working at the lowest level. In, the, in, uh, in, uh, in preventing malaria, we see it working. So it can do almost everything. So I think my country is being very innovative on how they deal with these things. In Rwanda, we've done it, and we think we still have a long way to go, but so far, so far, so good. Uh, we think all countries can do it. Thank you very much. Uh, Yusuf, I, I won't let you go yet. Um, you publish, in my view, one of the most uh, important uh, publications, and that's the Demographic Health Survey. You know, that book for me speaks to so much. Now, the topic today, we are looking at well-being, economic growth, trying to draw the link between the two. Could you give us a sense about the, the cost of inaction, you know, coming from the background of the demographic health survey? Tell us about the cost of inaction. Uh, the, the cost of inaction uh, is very big. Are you getting me? Uh, the cost of inaction is, uh, is very big. I'll try to make it uh, simple to digest uh, for young people. Uh, but our friend from the World Bank just mentioned, uh, gave us a hint. Uh, he said uh, from a human capital report, uh, especially in most of our countries, for example in Rwanda, uh, for children that are born now, given the circumstances that we are in today in Rwanda, vis-a-vis -vis access to health, vis-a-vis -vis access to education. You can only expect to achieve 37% of your potential. 37% of your potential. It's like a young person, most of you are either in school or are just about finishing school. You go for the, your first interview, and you can potentially earn a million Rwandan francs. And uh, after signing the contract, they cut off 670,000 Rwandan francs, and you're only given 370,000. I'm sure you'll be very disappointed. So I wanted to make it easy to understand. It's a very big loss, both to the individual, but also to the country as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we get to listen to the youth, the actual youth. Um, Grace, you, you run uh, an innovation hub uh, that works with uh, young people. Could you tell us some of the initiatives that you're working on and what's the link between health and as, as a young person, listening to these discussions around health, economic growth, can you relate to, to the discussion? Thank you so much. <coughs> um, I'd like to correct that I do not run the hub. I work with the hub. Um, and also before I begin, I'd like to really, really thank you NFPA for this opportunity to come and share with my fellow young people <coughs> about what we do at Outbox Hub. So um, together with UNFPA Uganda, we run a program called Up Accelerate, like Up and Accelerate. So the purpose of this program is to help young people create solutions <coughs> for around challenges of sexual reproductive health and gender-based violence faced by women, adolescents, and young people in their communities. So when we started in 2017, Yes, in 2017, we sent out a call and we told young people, hey, um, do you, are you aware of any challenges happening in your community around access to antenatal services, around teenage pregnancies, around access to any health services in your communities? If there, if there are any, can you think about innovative ways of doing this? Now, innovation, we did not refer to technology. 
innovation means a new way of doing things or a better way of doing what is currently existing. So we had over so many young people, over 100 applications. And out of these 100 applications, we picked out about 24 very, very brilliant ideas. And among these 24, we had uh, young people who looked out for a community in the Far East that had issues with access to antenatal services. So in this particular community, there was actually <laughs> no health facility that had an ultrasound scan. So one of the team members, how they came up with the inspiration is uh, she, she's a student of ultrasound at the university. She's graduating, I think, sometime next year. So when she did her internship, a number of mothers died due to issues that could have been, you know, prevented. So when she heard about this call, she said, you know what, there's this challenge, you need to build a solution around it. Now what it takes for you to build a solution for a problem that is happening is actually for you, one, to have an idea, okay? And to know people who have a skill with whom you can blend and create a solution. She was a student of ultrasound. She could read ultrasound, but she could not develop a software for which she wanted, okay? So she partnered with other people who could actually build software. And they build a software that is compatible to mobile phones, iPads, and a computer. And the product they developed is 10% of the actual cost of the ultrasound that the government of Uganda buys and places in these health facilities. I know what this means for us. If you talk about universal health coverage, things like um, affordability, you see? Mothers in hard to reach areas are going to be able to access affordable ultrasound services due to an innovation that a young person did. So their distribution model is uh, really, really interesting as well. So they partner with these health facilities because they are in very hard to reach areas. Mothers cannot afford to pay 100,000 Uganda shillings like I would in a medical facility within Kampala. So they partner with these health facilities and tell them, you know what, we are giving this to you at this particular amount and you will give me about 7,000 shillings every single month of the cost these mothers pay when they come. So instead of paying 100,000, you'll find that every mother would pay about 2,000 shillings to access ultrasound. And then we have another team that um, created a solution around um, menstrual. Menstrual health is a big deal in Uganda. I don't know how it is like in Rwanda. We have girls up to about three girls every single month will not go to school for four to five days because they are in their period. So during our info sessions, we were telling them about this, how you can, you know, uh, create a solution around menstrual health. And one of the ladies after the session came and told me, but Grace, you're telling us to, you know, to think about how to make affordable sanitary pads, yet some of us do not have, you know, uh, panties where to put the sanitary pads. You see, it's actually a challenge. They might not realize men, uh, menstrual health is, is a huge challenge, access to the sanitary pads, and even where to put the sanitary pads. So these young ladies who went to Mbara University, some graduated uh, this year, thought about sugarcane residue. You know sugarcane husks? After you're done chewing and you dump that, it's what they use to make sanitary pads. Very, very comfortable sanitary pads. I was excited to do some of the testing with the sanitary pads. It's almost the same as using always, you see? But then a girl in a rural community is going to access this um, at about 1,000 shillings, over 2,500 shillings less than the actual cost on the market, okay? We recently went to Northern Uganda. Uh, we're working with both refugee and non-refugee hosting communities. And we told them, you know what, young people, we want you to create solutions around sexual reproductive health for your communities. So we asked them what are the challenges they are facing. Can you solve around that? And there was a very, very interesting team that I'd also want to share about. So this team has a composition of three refugees and two members from the host community. One of the refugees was a medical worker in, in, in uh, South Sudan before the war, before they went to, to Uganda. And uh, some of the ladies on this team work with a village health team in the district we went to. 
So in their community, okay, I'm going to wrap up. In their community, the closest health facility is three hours away. Imagine a mother, you get your labor pains at 2 a.m. in the morning, you have to walk three hours. So to cut this short, these young people brought their skills together and now they are soon opening up a facility where young, where young mothers can actually go and access antenatal services and also uh, give birth safely. So for us, uh, we believe that social innovation is really a big deal. It's, it's a way young people should go to both empower themselves economically while solving solutions, health problems in their communities. So every health challenge in your community, young people here, should be an opportunity for you for business. Think about how you can create business around it, make it affordable, make it convenient, make it appealing for people to actually want to be there. And uh, yeah, you will not be poor. You'll actually be very happy knowing that a mother is accessing help while you are also in position to take care of your needs and probably pay for your kids' school fees. I'm sorry for taking that long. Uh, thank you so much, Grace. Just to mention that Grace will be available immediately after the session so you can have more discussions with her and uh, try to follow up. Uh, allow me to request uh, Babu. Uh, from Babu, yes. Uh, could you please uh, make a special intervention on the topic? Thank you. Thank you, madam. My name, in fact, is not Babu, but Bubu Draman Kamara. No problem. I'm coming from uh, West Africa, coming from a country named uh, Cabo Verde, where I am the UNDP, UN UNICEF, and UNFPA representatives. As Mrs. Uh, the director knows, UNDP has, uh, UN has uh, made a reform on 2008 and to try to bring together these uh, three agencies in a small country where the population is about, about uh, 500,000 in uh, Cabo Verde and 700,000 outside of the country. So it's a small country, an archipelago with 10 islands. So the issue of working as UN together is a challenge. It's for that reason I am presenting myself as a UNDP and UNICEF and UNDP, uh, UNFPA UN representatives. I really want to thank UNFPA to give the opportunity for me as UNDP first, uh, first person to interact with uh, this uh, distinguished panelist and also for the young people. I'm really, truly honored to have these young people in front of me and asking them my first question, but because I want to pay justice or your presence here. Do you want me to express myself in French? What is my better language or should I continue in English? Ok, donc j'entends français, j'entends anglais, mais les panélistes, je pense, parlent beaucoup mieux l'anglais. So let me, allow me to do that in English and a few words. One of the panelists said that there is an evident linkage between well-being of youth and economic development. We don't need to argue more on that. That is clear. And yesterday, you have heard also some of young people showing that the world is changing in very unprecedented way. And the first agent who can influence this change is you, young people. So please keep it up. Show your commitment to be part of the debate and sit around the table, as someone said, don't be on the menu, but have your voice, make your voice loud, and uh, speak on your 
or your interest on what you should expect from the government, from the civil organization, from the communities, and from also your families. As the CIS director said, this issue of young teen, teenager pregnancy is something we should never discuss on that in this 21st century. It's clear that that is an abomination that is against the right of the, children, the people. So we should make a voice loud and to work on that. But to work on that also, it's we need, as my uh, the one of the panelists said, to have a kind of integrated approach to finance the whole development issue. The use issue is not isolated. Use issue is uh, linked to education, to job creation, to universal health coverage, and all it is cross sectoral issues. So for that reason, we need sound public policies from the national first. They have to put themselves in the driver's seat, not to wait for the partners, international partners, to come and to see, to tell them that is the solution. Solution will not come from the World Bank who tell you, you have to be careful how to manage your budget, your debt expenditure uh, budget. You have not to wait for UNDP who tell you that that is your priority. But first at the driver's seat is the national authorities. But the national authorities can't work alone. They have to work also with civil societies, with in some countries, with religious force. Because in some countries, the barrier, the challenges are also in our cultures. On some Muslim countries, talking about uh, sexuality of uh, children, of uh, young people, is kind of taboo. So how to confront that is, uh, is an issue. So my message, my first message is to the young people. Please make your voice loud and continue to be part of the debate. From the government side, please tackle this issue of youth health as across sectoral issues. It is not only health issues or youth issues, it is how to manage. It's a gov uh, governance, economic governance issue. So we have to be able to put sound, implement sound policies in order to tackle all these issues. I want to maybe to stop here and uh, tell you, <laughs> and tell you also that in the coming days, I will, I will finish, in Cap Verde, we will launch a national summit for youth, 17 to 19. It will be opened by the head of state and also with the ministers. We are expecting 120 young people and also other partners. I invite the young person to tell them, please, if you go in your respective countries, ask them, have we this kind of forum? Have you a national youth policy? We should put that in place in order to make our voice loud. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for your intervention. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, so we'll have to wrap up the session. Uh, but it's your turn as young people in the audience to give us a bit of feedback in terms of your thoughts. Please, you have to be very short, straight to the point. And I'm looking for someone from West Africa, if you could share your experience. So someone from Tanzania is also complaining. Maybe we can do East Africa, West Africa. Yes. How about that? Straight so to the point. Straight, straight to, the, to point. the point. If you're kind with us, we shall allow more questions. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Songa Daniel from Kenya, uh, and I have uh, some concern to put across. Uh, one, I'm happy that we are having a health summit. There's one point that we do lose as a uh, youth where we are lost mental health. Yeah, so I feel like mental health is a big thing. We see it as youth. We get stressed. We put memes. People think we are funny, but we are just trying to push the problems out of our heart through those jokes. So, thank you. Is that your Sorry? Question? Please. 
uh, yeah, I was talking about mental health. Whenever we talk about health, we just talk about reproductive health, we talk about sexuality, but we don't talk about mental health. And I believe that if I don't have a vision, then if other of my colleagues don't have, then we don't have Africa. We must have mental health, we should consider it, and uh, I think that's the challenge I can put across. Thank you. Thank you. Please um, keep your comments Justice brief. to the ladies. Straightforward question. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rehema Masanga from Tanzania, and I have two concerns. They could be questions. One, please. Um, one, yes. <laughs> okay. They're all important. So in Tanzania, one person to afford, you spoke about health insurance. So for one person to have a health insurance or a family, it costs 649 USD per year. We still talking to the government and see how they could put that less for everybody to afford. I don't know how UNFPA, um, UNDP, um, all the health and World Bank see how we could really put this back so that everyone can afford. Secondly, you spoke about sexual reproductive health. Condoms and um, contraceptives are provided free. How about pads? Because we think that if girls can miss school for three days. Why don't we give pads for free? We want pads for free for girls, if condoms can be given for free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um. Bana, we can take those ones. And I, I think we'll have one more, one extra. One, just one more, please. Okay. Um. At the back, at the back. He's complaining, West Africa, you promised. Okay, please, uh, good rest. morning to you all. I'm Michael from Ghana. Thanks to our panelists for their wonderful presentation. I want to make an input, and it's about the type of health delivery we are practicing in Africa. It's very difficult to assess healthcare in Africa, the cost of it. And I believe that is mainly because of the orthodox approach to healthcare. Before the orthodox approach, we had indigenous methods that we were using to treat various forms of illness and other health-related issues. And I believe in international institutions like the World Bank, the UNDP, should invest more in developing the capacity of African countries to invest in their own indigenous methods. Imagine a poor farmer in Ghana trying to fight cancer with chemotherapy when that person is not even earning $2 a day. Meanwhile, we have traditional means of fighting all these forms of diseases, and they've existed for hundreds of years. What we need to do is to invest in them, build the capacities of local traditional herbalists, and they can confront some of the diseases we try to spend millions of dollars fighting in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go at the back, at the back, please. One final. Sorry, uh, Bana, we've, <laughs> we've run out of time. Let me just have one person here. Okay. Th I'll ask the translator to please come here and be given a mic so he can she can translate for us. Thank you very much. My name is Damaseni Bizimana. I'm, I'm from Rwanda. I'm a deaf as you see. I want to thank the panelists for the good discussion you have been doing. You have talked about SRH and GBV. But I want to ask like our people from UNFPA and World Bank, how do you make sure that your programs are inclusive? It means that how do you make sure that you include person with disability in your programs? For example, deaf people, how do you include them about SRH and GBV programs. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, thank you so much. Unfortunately, because we're running out of time, uh, I will ask the panelists to uh, make a general comment on the specific uh, questions, and then we'll have uh, 30 seconds for wrapping up your final key message. Um, do you want to start, Dr. Martin? I have 
actually do want to start because I might have to leave the panel for another one. But really lovely questions and I wish I could be here. But the UNFPA colleagues are in the room and we can answer any other questions. I, I, I really appreciate the conversation around mental health because indeed, particularly for young, young girls, it's amazing how a number of their sexual and reproductive ill health is actually linked to depression and mental health. And so for us, it is really important that we integrate it in that conversation. We're also seeing a lot of shift in terms of risk behaviors for young people that are driven around alcohol use or drug use. And so I think it's a real concern and, and, and we are seeing rising level, levels also of suicide amongst African youth. So we have to take this seriously. And more and more we're integrating it, especially on the issues of violence, into psychosocial support that is provided through the health system. I'm, I'm gonna also focus on the question I think around um, PADS. I think you talked about commodities, reproductive health commodities, and there are a range of them. And some are free and some are not. And I think more and more we're seeing in different countries. UNFPA last year created what we call an Africa Coalition on Menstrual Health Management. And it's a broad coalition that looks at practices and ways in which we can look at products, so affordable products through innovative ways, but also look at issues of stigma, discrimination, and all across a life cycle approach of menstrual health. Um, and see how the ways are. And there are countries that have now adopted policy around free pads as part of delivery. Kenya is one of those. The final question I wanted to respond to was Rwanda. Um, because I do think we are very conscious, and again, UNFPA ensures that we find those most vulnerable. And indeed, we are seeing a lot of vulnerability within the context of disability. And we've worked to, to really look at a framework for sexual and reproductive health for people living with disabilities and see how we can incorporate that into the conversations around youth development and youth health. In addition, um, Grace was talking about innovation in, in Uganda. Innovation in Kenya has actually led to a sign language that is used on an app. It's called App Mulimu, which particularly targets deaf sign language in Kenya. And young people themselves developed that app as a way to access. So not only in terms of really ensuring the system are able to look for and identify specific needs of people with disability, but that young disabled people are getting engaged in ways in which they can deliver that. So I think we can continue to expand that work. I'll stop there. My key message is for young people. Again, viva young people, viva. I think your time is now. For young people of Africa, your time is now. The world's attention, the global attention, Africa's attention is on you. You are that hidden best asset that we have to really make Africa prosper. So the responsibility is really on you to really take this connectedness that we're looking at, to take the partnerships that we're offering they are people who want to mentor you, they want to work with you. We are a UN agency that, and the whole UN system is giving you a platform for which to really leverage what you have best. So really, this is your time. Be bold, be courageous. It is difficult. As an old gray mama, I can tell you it's difficult. And it will only get diff more difficult. But I believe and we believe and find those who believe in you and trust in you and work with them and be responsible about it. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, um, I'll focus on, um, on the cost of health insurance. Uh, I don't think it should be very expensive, especially if it's universal health insurance and if it's targeting um, uh, primary health care. I'll tell you why. Uh, in fact, in Rwanda, upper limit for a household of around eight people, uh, which is not very common in Rwanda anymore because the average household size now is around five people. Uh, on average, a household of around eight people, annual premium for the community health insurance is actually $30. $30. 
and it's making wonders. So um, I think uh, as long as you are innovative around it, uh, you work with all stakeholders, you should be able to do it. And uh, as I wind up, uh, my message is, young people, uh, I think this is the right time to start mobilizing, mobilizing around this especially, uh, because some countries think it's very difficult, yet in actual sense it's not very difficult, as long as they prioritize it. And uh, take the lead. Thank you very much. To, uh, about um, inclusion. So I'll still keep it around innovation. For starters, we, where I work, under the program we do, we underwent a training for disability inclusion for us to understand things like reasonable accommodation. So even when we developed uh, platforms like SAFPA, where young people can um, confidentially report cases of abuse, you know, and, and link them to support. We made sure that it is inclusive because we know that our brothers and sisters that have disabilities, you know, sometimes cannot speak up. So we ask in, when you're reporting, we ask you, are you disabled? What form of disability do you have? So that we make sure when we are linking you to a service, for instance, you need to get help, medical attention, we make sure that the required accommodation is available, be it interpretation, be it, I don't know, whatever it is. Your key message. Yeah, so, uh, and my key message is, um, yeah, like how I mentioned earlier, young people, every problem is an opportunity for you to create a solution. So keep your eyes wide open. Uh, you cannot do everything on your own. So partner with people who can complement your abilities and let's make our communities better. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's for you. Uh, I think uh, all of the inspirational uh, 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 ideas have been already mentioned, so I'll just focus on a broad picture. And um, let's, let's call this economic development and human development a sort of a, a virtuous uh, cycle, right? Circle. It's a virtuous circle. One feeds the other. Let's use our economic uh, development of the moment, additional resources that we have at every level, households, individuals, country, to invest in human development, health and education. And let's see how it brings us back uh, very nice uh, uh, payoffs in the future. This has proven in many contexts, many countries, Africa is on the right path, Rwanda is on the right path especially. And uh, let's, let's uh, prioritize this and let's invest in human development. And you as a young people, uh, you need to demand from your government to make sure that they, they invest sufficiently in human development. That brings me my key message. Thank you so much. Uh, as I wrap up, please don't leave the room. We'll have uh, a photo op uh, for everyone, including a selfie, young people with selfies. But some of the key messages coming out of this session, one, um, we need political commitment to achieve our objectives. The link is very clear between uh, our well-being and economic growth. As young people, we need to start uh, to be consciously aware of our responsibilities, not just in terms of uh, uh, the day-to-day -day activities that we do, jobs, but also in our health. Are we making responsible health uh, choices? Access to contraceptives for young people is crucial and will be key for us to be able to achieve uh, sustainable growth. Young people have to be active players. Your time is now. There's no tomorrow. And clearly there's a cost to inaction. So we can avoid the evidence, but the cost to inaction will be visibly clear. And as young people, let us try to be bold. Our time is now. Let's try to look for the opportunities like Grace is, is doing. There's a business case in terms of solving the challenges around us. Thank you so much uh, for being part of this discussion. Thank you so much, uh, my distinguished panel. We'll now have a photo op. Um, first, we'll have the panel, and then we'll have the selfie with everyone in the room. Thank you so much for being part of this. We would like to please request the guest of honor to also join the panelists.
and we agreed to have smiles in this session. So we hope that it begins with you. Okay, maybe one with the MC too. <laughs> you get to use the mic. Thank you very much. Now, time for a selfie. If we want to do things differently as young people, they have to agree with selfies, right? So I'll have the guest of honor and the speakers at the front row. She's being proactive. Um, Yeah, we come down first row. And I will request all the young people in the audience to please come forward. Let's all be in the picture. We need to make sure that we are in this picture. Yeah. First row, okay. Someone told should help us with this technology. <laughs> Tag at UNFPA Rwanda, please, and tweet, let the world know that we are in Rwanda. <laughs> and we have a very important session tomorrow, organized by Mijeprof, Imbuto Foundation, UNFPA, and other partners at 11 in the main auditorium. Don't miss on that one, okay? You're busy taking selfies, but I'm really hoping that these announcements are getting to you. So. And feel free to remain seated for the next session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We will be starting our next session in the next five minutes. The next session will be about skills for the future session. Uh, we will talk about skills for the future, and of course, we will be having various people, including Mr. Fred Swanika, who will be talking to us uh, about the skills and uh, how we can grow. So please stay behind as we start off the next session in the next five minutes. Thank you. Tomorrow, 11, in the main auditorium, an interesting station on teenage pregnancies. Don't forget to tweet hashtag YCA Health and follow UNFPA Rwanda for a conversation that is happening today at 3 p.m. with our regional director. Thank you. Baraka haki hazi kwishi Sikama bila tamabadi liki 